On the afternoon of June 25, 2015, along the shoreline of Deer Island near Boston, Massachusetts, a woman was walking her dog when she came across a plastic bag. At first, she thought nothing of it, assuming it was little more than trash someone had discarded. But when her dog refused to leave it alone, she got closer, only to discover the horrible truth. Inside was the body of an infant child. Immediately, she reported the find to the authorities and they showed up on the scene to investigate. At first, though, despite their best efforts, they were unable to identify the Jane Doe on account of decomposition, which had already occurred. Because of that, the case was left in limbo. While this was frustrating for everyone involved, especially the public after being made aware of the incident, eventually some bitter resolution presented itself when it was revealed that the young girl's name was Bella Bond. Not only that, but the prime suspects in her death were none other than her own mother and stepfather. This is Monsters. The case of Bella Bond's murder is a particularly tragic one given how young she was and how easily her life had been snuffed out by those she trusted most. But even now, almost a decade later, there still remains some ambiguity as to what exactly happened on the fateful night of her passing. In order to try to gather the best picture of the incident, we first have to go back to somewhat happier times for her family when she was first coming into the world. Maybe happy isn't the right word to use either, though, because even as far back as November of 2011, when Bella was conceived, her mother was deep in the throes of heroin addiction. She was so heavily involved in the local drug scene, it had gotten to the point where she had taken to prostituting herself in order to get some money for her next fix. Unfortunately, it's a sad state of affairs and one that's still all too easy for a young woman to fall into under certain circumstances. In Rochelle Bond's case, the chips fell in such a way that, by the time her daughter was on the way, she'd already been arrested twice for prostitution and heroin possession, once in 2010 and then again in early 2011. Not that she didn't have anything good in her life, though. Despite the misery surrounding her, she did have a partner in the form of a man named Joseph Amoroso. Of course, with him being a crack cocaine addict himself, the two were unable to hold down any form of regular employment, and so they had taken to living in a tent at Occupy Boston in Dewey Square, a spot where a number of protesters had gathered to take a stand against the financial initiations of the city, similar to what was happening with Occupy Wall Street around the same time. In the case of Rochelle and Joseph, their being there had nothing to do with social rebellion. It was just a place they could stay and remain somewhat hidden free to do as they pleased and not be noticed by the police for the most part. Despite them feeling safe there, and despite them initially being happy a baby was coming, their relationship began to sour once it became apparent to Joseph that his partner had been sleeping with other men without his knowledge. That was why soon after, he disappeared from the scene, with him never getting a chance to meet his daughter in person. That only added to the new mother-to-be's stress as now, not only was she having to deal with the fact that she was about to have a child, but she was going to have to do it all alone. Now, it wasn't as if she didn't know what she was getting herself into because, prior to this pregnancy, she'd already given birth to two children. In those cases, the babies were quickly taken away by the Department of Children and Families on account of her drug addiction. She didn't want that to happen again, and so this time, Rochelle vowed to do things correctly. That's not to say she was always able to stay clean, however. She was far too deep into her addiction by now. But she was at least able to make an effort to abstain from drugs as she attempted to transform herself into a responsible mother. On August 6, 2012, Bella Bond was born at Boston Medical Center. 
After seeing her daughter in person for the first time, Rochelle's resolve was only strengthened as she set about being the best mother she could be under the circumstances. She was even able to get them both off the streets, and she secured an apartment on Maxwell Street in nearby Dorchester. Sure, her addiction was still playing a big part of her life, but even more so than that, Bella was her real love now. It was something that was apparent to those around her as well, with friends and family regularly commenting on how much of a loving mother she was. For all of her best efforts, she was still a woman struggling with heroin addiction and it meant things slipped into old patterns on occasion. In fact, there were multiple reports of neglect levied against her as the months went on, with them leading to the Department of Children and Families getting in contact with her both in 2012 and 2013. While there were definite concerns about the household situation each time they made contact, even the DCF noted that Rochelle appeared to be genuine in her desire to raise her child as best she could. Sure, she was struggling to do so given her circumstances, but as far as they were concerned, this was something they could help her with through means of additional support if she felt like she needed it. Rochelle took the assistance they offered in the short term as, in her mind, it would help to further prove she was a capable and responsible mother. That worked in the end, because each time they signed off on her case, she was allowed to keep full custody of Bella. Still, by then, Rochelle was beginning to feel the strain of raising a young girl alone, and perhaps that's why she continued to stay in contact with Joseph Amoroso over the phone, something that allowed him to get to know her a little better. Even if he was now in contact with the family again, he never did return to see Bella in person. Feeling like she needed a new partner to help her through this process, Rochelle eventually began dating a man named Michael McCarthy. He was a local man who first came into contact with Rochelle in January of 2015. While he may have seemed normal at first, it quickly became apparent that that was the furthest thing from the truth. Not only was he also addicted to hard drugs, but he was also prone to bizarre outbursts where he'd rant about demons and the dangers they posed to everyone around him. He was so interested in the supernatural, in fact, some people who knew him described it as an obsession. They explained how he would read everything he could find on the subject to the point that it became all he could ever think about. Still, even if he was an off-the-wall character to say the least, Rochelle fell for him anyway. Pretty soon they were living together at her home on Maxwell Street. It was there that things fully started to go off the rails. Despite her best efforts to remain clean, living with another addict proved to be too much and before long she was back to injecting heroin on a regular basis. According to her neighbors, this not only changed her behavior, but also left them with further cause for concern after they started hearing a young girl crying through the walls at night. Even Rochelle's friends noticed something was different at that point because she stopped updating her Facebook page, something she had done regularly prior to that with a consistent stream of photos featuring her and Bella. Now, any new updates on the girl were becoming fewer and further between. With Rochelle herself being seen less in public as well, it left folks who knew her to wonder exactly what was going on behind closed doors. Had Michael McCarthy been a bad influence on his partner and caused her to relapse? That's certainly what people feared, and it was also what Michael Sprinsky, an old friend of Rochelle's, feared too. While staying at their house briefly, he witnessed what he described as escalating abuse levied towards the young child living there. According to him, one night when they were unable to get Bella to quiet down, Rochelle and Michael locked her in a cupboard for hours while she screamed from inside. On another occasion, when her behavior was continuing to get worse, the pair openly discussed their belief that demons were possessing the girl. It gives me some serious Chad and Lori Daybell vibes. It was definitely a cause for concern, so much so that Michael Sprinsky reported it to the police. Of course, like so many other cases of child abuse, at the time nothing seemed to come of it and things just carried on as they had been. It's unclear why exactly nothing was done about the reports, but it would become an issue for the authorities down the line, just as it would become an issue for the Department of Children and Families when Joseph Amoroso made a report to them that also went nowhere. Of course, his worries had nothing to do with any abuse he'd witnessed. No, instead he developed fears after noticing the mother of his child slurring her words while on the phone with her. 
Perhaps that's why, after realizing his report was going nowhere, he got in his car and traveled to Rochelle's home. He immediately recognized the signs of someone who had fully relapsed. As he would later put it in court, quote, She looked like she was strung out. I know that lifestyle and I could see it from a mile away. What Joseph didn't realize at the time, though, was that any concerns he may have had about the safety of the household, and in particular the safety of his daughter, were too little too late as Bella had already been dead for months. Unfortunately, the worst had already happened without him or anyone else even being aware of it. But how could no one have noticed? Well, it was because Rochelle had been lying to them all, of course. As far as her friends and family were concerned, Bella had been taken away some time ago by the DCF after they'd made another visit to the family home and determined the situation to be too much for a young girl. This was a complete lie, of course, but given the circumstances, people were inclined to believe it and didn't seem to question the story any further. When the body of an unidentified girl was discovered soon thereafter, no one put two and two together as they believed there was no possible way this case could be in any way related to Bella Bond. Sadly, they would be proven wrong. The process of figuring out the girl's identity would be a lengthy and arduous task, which brings us right back to where we started. It was on June 25, 2015, the process began when the unidentified body of a three-year-old girl was discovered along the shoreline of Deer Island. As mentioned earlier, identifying the body of the child was easier said than done on account of the decomposition that had already taken place. Unable to say with any degree of certainty who they'd found, the police labeled her a Jane Doe and set about opening an investigation. The first step in the investigation was to examine everything on her person at the time of her discovery, with that amounting to no more than a black and white polka dot styled pair of leggings and a zebra print blanket, there was little to go on. Next, the team brought cadaver dogs to the search area to see if there were any other remaining items nearby. Unfortunately, that proved fruitless and afterwards everyone was sent back to the drawing board. While they were busy thinking about what to do next, news had gotten out to the general public about the horrific discovery along the coast. That was why, over the days and weeks that followed, the site became something of a memorial, with locals leaving flowers in an attempt to honor the unidentified girl who'd been taken too soon, even if they didn't know who she was yet. It was a moment of pure humanity for a community that had been rocked by this crime. And it was one that proved that, even if something truly evil must have led to the girl's death, there was still plenty of good out there. Of course, for as heartwarming as that was, none of it helped the police figure out the Jane Doe's identity. Luckily, small breakthroughs would gradually start to come after her autopsy on July 3rd when it was determined that, despite the initial belief being she died only days before her discovery, she was probably already dead for up to a month by the time her remains were placed along the coast. The only way that could have been possible would have been if she was kept on ice in some way, a realization that led the authorities to figure out her body had probably been stored inside of a refrigerator. If that was the case, it meant that this was absolutely no accident. And despite the autopsy not turning up any signs of obvious injury on the body or any trace of drugs or alcohol in her system, it was widely accepted now that foul play was involved. That wasn't the only breakthrough at this point, however. At the same time, the United States Coast Guard completed their analysis of the tides during the period of the body's discovery and came to the determination that it was highly unlikely she had washed up on the shore. Investigators realized that it was far more likely she had been placed there, which meant the killer or killers were probably from the local area or somewhere nearby. This theory was only added to by the fact that the clothing found at the scene was manufactured by the Serco company, which was likely purchased from a local Target store. On top of that, tests of the blanket the girl had on her when she was found determined it was likely made by the Cannon Mills company and purchased at a Kmart nearby. Now, I know what you're thinking. There are still Kmarts open in the U.S.? Yeah, it was news to me too. After tracing the origin of the blanket and clothing, Pollen and isotope analyses carried out on the body confirmed that she had spent time in the New England area prior to her death. 
Of course, all of these factors proved to be particularly important to the investigators because early on, there was speculation the girl could have come from as far away as Canada. With that theory looking far less likely now, it meant the search area could be narrowed down dramatically. That allowed the police time to focus on other areas of the investigation, such as attempting to ascertain the ethnicity of the body. She was badly decomposed when she was found, so figuring out something as simple as ethnicity had presented a problem initially. With further forensic investigation, it was eventually determined that the child was white with possibly a hint of Hispanic ancestry. They believe her hair would have been brown and wavy, and based on its length and condition, it likely hadn't been cut or trimmed for around two years. When it came to mistreatment, however, there didn't appear to be any long-term evidence of malnutrition or abuse, so the idea she had been abused over a long period of time was ruled out. Unfortunately, not only were there no birthmarks or scars discovered on her body, but nothing came back with a head after DNA tests were done on hair and teeth samples, making identifying the girl all the more difficult. Authorities started investigating nearby areas of interest where they thought they might be able to find out more information. One of the first areas was a water treatment plant located nearby. The treatment plant showed up on the investigator's radar because it was in the area the body had been discovered. The area was said to always be busy with workers from the plant, and as a result, it was believed one of them may have dumped the body there at night after finishing a shift, possibly while on their way home. Of course, this would have meant the employee would have had to arrive at work earlier that day with the body either in their car or in a bag on their person. And given there was no evidence to suggest something like that had gone unnoticed by everyone else working there, the idea was eventually ruled out. Still, the idea that the body had been placed along the shoreline at night remained the most viable theory, but that was hardly enough to help the team figure out who might have been there that night. Realizing they hit a dead end, they decided to try to get help from the public. Luckily by then, they had something more concrete to show people. They had reached out to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and asked for their help in creating a computer-generated image of what the deceased girl probably looked like. With that image going out to the media, it wasn't long before Jane Doe's face was plastered all over the local news. On top of that, the public also spread it around themselves via printed photos on local storefronts and digital reposts on social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter. Even CNN News host Anderson Cooper got involved when, on July 10th, he aired a televised interview with John Walsh, co-founder of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and former host of America's Most Wanted. During that interview, they went into detail discussing the case and the possible culprits involved, with John Walsh arguing that someone knew what had happened to Jane Doe and that, in his opinion, it was likely someone close to her. When asked why no one else who knew her had come forward, he reasoned that people didn't generally want to talk to the authorities, possibly due to the threat of them investigating their own lives. As an example, he cited Angelica Castillo, a young woman who had gone missing in Manhattan in 1991, and who was later reported dead, but hadn't had a missing persons report filed against her as her family were undocumented immigrants. While John Walsh may have been convinced foul play by a family member was the key to unlocking the case, the authorities weren't limiting themselves to just one line of inquiry and were keeping themselves open to any potential leads. Unfortunately, though, once the digital reconstruction of the girl's face was made public on July 2nd, it caused more than a few headaches for authorities. That was because, as a result of it being created in Photoshop, Many people mistook the image as being an actual picture of the young girl, rather than the composite image it was. While it did lead to a lot of positive information coming in, it also led to some bad leads too. Something that only made the investigators' job harder as they now had to sift through those leads as well. Two days after the composite image was made public, the girl was also entered into the National Missing and Unidentified Persons system. Despite cross-referencing her physical characteristics with a number of other missing young girls across the United States, no matches came up. Of course, that did at least mean that various other possible identities could be ruled out. 
It also meant there was an increasing likelihood the girl had never been reported missing at all, something that most people took to mean she was either from an undocumented family or that her family weren't aware that she was missing. Those weren't the only possible reasons why a child wouldn't be reported missing, though. Some argued that the girl's family may also be dead, with them possibly dying under similar circumstances. And of course, there was still the chance she'd actually been killed by a family member as John Walsh had suspected. After all, according to data gathered from similar cases, it is statistically far less likely for a child to be murdered by a stranger than they are by a family member. If that was the case, there remained the possibility that other children were still living within the household and that they were in danger themselves. That only increased the urgency to find the killer or killers, and that was why every possible lead that came in was investigated to its fullest. At one point, it even looked like there might finally be a breakthrough when someone reported a woman who had been seen throwing a garbage bag over a bridge not long before the Jane Doe was discovered. But upon speaking to the woman, she was quickly ruled out as a suspect. It turned out that the bag she had thrown away contained nothing more than rotten fruit. Meanwhile, other tips were coming in thick and fast such as a variety of people who claimed they'd seen the girl being accompanied by a woman wearing a burqa at places like a local store or the playground of a nearby school. On top of that, one man even claimed he'd seen the girl being pushed in a stroller by a heavy-set blonde woman at a laundromat a few months prior. There were suggestions that the girl could have been Aaliyah Lunsford, a young female from West Virginia who'd gone missing in September of 2011. But these, along with the rest of the tips, were all ultimately ruled out as no hard evidence could be found to verify any of them. It was all starting to look a bit hopeless, and those working the case were beginning to wonder if they were ever going to be able to solve the crime. Thankfully for them, it was right when things looked at their darkest that the moment they were waiting for finally happened. Michael Sprinsky, the friend of Rochelle's who had previously stayed with her, contacted the police with alarming information. This wasn't the same information he'd given them before when he talked about the conditions Bella had been living under. No, that report was still lost somewhere in the ether, and wouldn't be rediscovered until later on down the line. What he relayed to them now was a conversation he'd had with Rochelle, where she apparently told him her boyfriend Michael had killed their daughter and then demanded she help him dispose of the body. Of course, it should come as no surprise to anyone that investigators quickly put two and two together and began to suspect the body of baby Jane Doe may very well be that of Bella Bond. Feeling like the end of their search was finally near, they drove over to Rochelle and Michael's home on September 17, 2015 with a search warrant in hand and questioned the couple. Over the course of the questioning, it was determined that their claim that Bella had been taken away by the Department of Children and Families was verifiably false, and that they were clearly hiding something. That was why they continued to push, eventually leading to Rochelle coming clean and admitting to what had happened. As she described it, one night either in May or June of 2015, because you tend to forget when your child was murdered, Michael had gone into Bella's room to try to get her to go to sleep. In an apparent fit of rage, he repeatedly slammed his fist into the girl's stomach. He had done it with such intensity that, by the time he was finished, her skin was blue and gray. At that point, realizing something had happened, Rochelle ran into the room and was shocked to find her daughter lying unconscious in her bed. But when she attempted to administer CPR, Michael grabbed her by the neck and threatened to kill her if she told anyone what he had done. As far as he was concerned, what he had done had been necessary since the child was a demon and needed to die. That's right, it now appeared that Michael's unhealthy obsession with the supernatural had led to him believing Bella was herself infected with the spirit of a demon. So in his mind, the only way to destroy this hellspawn was to kill the host body. Now that he had finished doing the deed and the haze of the moment was beginning to clear, he suddenly realized he had to get rid of the body without getting caught. So, while he figured out a way to carry that out, he placed the girl's remains in a garbage bag and stored them inside the family's refrigerator. Because, why not? 
Once he had a chance to think of a plan for how to dispose of Bella, he forcibly injected Rochelle with heroin in order to make her more suggestible, and convinced her to accompany him to South Boston under the threat of violence in order to dump the body in the harbor. Unfortunately for him, though, a couple of weeks later, that body would wash up along the shore of Deer Island and would there be discovered by an unsuspecting woman simply walking her dog. While investigators had suspected something like this had occurred for some time now, it still must have been stomach-churning to hear it all be confirmed. It must have also been difficult to hear that, while parts of their investigation had been heading in the right direction, so much of what they thought they knew, such as the body being placed along the shore, were wrong. Had it not been for such a lucky break, it's entirely possible the police would never have been led to the identity of Bella and unveiled who had murdered her. While it was certainly possible Rochelle Bond had no direct involvement in the murder and was only going along with everything that happened out of fear of her partner, there were still some discrepancies which, at least initially, led investigators to suspect she may have been more involved than she was letting on. On a housing subsidy benefits form she'd filled out not long before the police spoke to her, she listed Bella as being alive. And sure, it would have only invited suspicion had she written down that she was dead. The financial aspect of it made some people wonder if she wasn't involved in using the situation to cheat the welfare system. There was also the fact that, despite her claims Bella had been punched in the stomach until she was blue with bruises, the medical examiner was unable to find evidence that the girl had died of such blunt force trauma. They had found bruises on her body, including some on her abdomen, but none that were deemed severe enough to be the cause of death. This didn't necessarily mean the punches hadn't led to her death, as was later argued by Dr. Henry Neilds when he claimed the compression caused on the girl's abdomen and chest could have resulted in either asphyxiation or the stoppage of her heart. Still, even with his expertise on the subject, Dr. Neilds could not say conclusively if his suspicions were indeed true. As a result, the story of Rochelle Bond was put into question, with it only getting worse when, after Michael was formally arrested the following day, he denied any knowledge of Bella's death. So you had no interaction with the child, or something didn't happen to the child that could have caused harm to that child? <laughs> I mean, I had interaction with the child, yeah, but like what? nothing that would have caused harm right. to her. No. Like playing with her, talking with her, uh, being around the house when she was around there, going out with the dog, taking her to the park, things like that. Why Why would Rochelle tell us that you, you hit the child? Hit Bella? Couldn't tell you. No? No. And I don't think Rochelle would let someone stay around that was did, did you hitting have, her child. Did she ever hit the child? Not that I saw. No, that's why I was kind of surprised when she even said when someone spanked her on the said someone said spanked her said someone said they saw her spank her on the bum. I was even kind of surprised at that. Right, listen, Mike, now's your chance to get out from under whatever you're under and come clean and tell us what happened and let us figure this out. Because if you just sit here and blow smoke up my ass and our asses and lie and lie and lie and lie, you're just digging yourself in a big, bigger hole. I'm not blowing smoke up anyone's ass. Okay. If you're saying, you know, I might look nervous, maybe it's because I'm about to go into a major no, no. surgery in an hour. No, I'm just, like I said, you I'm know, talking like to you. You couldn't have caught me at a worse time. It's okay. Like, you're doing great. I'm telling you right now, you're doing great. You know, the, the whole interview was going great until I sort of confront you with some things that, that, aren't, that I don't believe aren't truth. You know, so again, something happened to the little girl, okay? You don't know Bella's dead? No. Really? No. Huh? She's not? Not to my knowledge. Are you sure? Positive. You didn't drive over to East Boston? No. Southie? Southie? No. Boston Harbor? No. No? No. Of course, Michael placed the blame solely on his partner's shoulders. As he put it, Rochelle, a known habitual drug user who had lost custody of two children already in the past, was neglectful of her daughter to the point of criminality. While he couldn't confirm how Bella had died, he was insistent that he had nothing to do with it. 
The way he described it, it was probably her who had killed her daughter while in the depths of a heroin binge. As if her drugged out state wasn't evidence enough that her testimony couldn't be trusted, the fact that she had continued to claim welfare in the name of her child after her death was just further proof. Even Michael Sprinsky's prior police report that both Rochelle and Michael had been involved in locking Bella in a cupboard seemed to go against her claims she was completely innocent. With each side blaming the other, Rochelle was also placed under arrest and the two awaited trial. And while it remained unclear as to who had been the one to kill the young girl, the police at least now felt confident that they had the killer or killers in custody. Of course, when the news got out, it hit the local community hard. The idea that a child had been murdered was bad enough, but her being murdered by her family was another level of depravity altogether. When later questioned about his initial reactions to the news, Bella's father, Joseph Amoroso, would state that he had never considered the idea that the Jane Doe could be his own flesh and blood. As to why the composite photo released to the public didn't raise any alarms with him, as far as he was concerned, that image didn't look anything like his little girl. Considering this was a man who had never actually met his daughter in person and who had only seen her through photographs, perhaps some confusion could be understandable. Either way, the news came as a complete shock to him, as it did to Bella's maternal grandmother who didn't even know she had a granddaughter up until the moment the story broke. Of all the ways to find out you were a grandmother, perhaps this was the worst way imaginable. And it didn't get any easier for her or the rest of the family either, because with each of the potential killers getting separate trial dates, things would only get dragged out longer as a result. Even getting to the trial was a lengthy process for everyone involved because, after Rochelle Bond and Michael McCarthy were arraigned on September 21st, 2015, they spent the next year waiting for a court date. Not that they could go anywhere during that time, though, because, with Rochelle's bond being set at a million dollars, and Michael being held without bail, both would remain in custody until the trial started. Eventually, after over a year of preparation, Rochelle would be the first to go to trial on December 1st, 2016. Of course, predictably, she stuck to her original story and denied any wrongdoing, other than the fact that she'd helped to dispose of her daughter's body afterwards. As she had told the police before, she claimed that she had done it under duress. So given the circumstances, she felt she wouldn't be held liable for taking part. But while the court was leaning more and more towards believing her story by now, it didn't completely free her of responsibility. Regardless of whether she had actually killed her daughter or not, she was still an accessory to murder. Also, the fact that she had claimed around $1,400 of welfare long after she knew Bella was dead meant that she was potentially guilty of larceny. So even if she was found not guilty of murder, it was very likely she would still be serving time. But if things were looking grim for her, they were looking far worse for her partner. That was because, when his trial began six months later in early June of 2017, the evidence overwhelmingly suggested he'd been the mastermind of the entire thing. Aside from the bruises on her daughter's body lining up with Rochelle's story and the possibility that these blows could have caused her to go into cardiac arrest, there was also the fact that, upon further investigation of the Bond household, cadaver dogs indicated that a corpse had likely been kept in the refrigerator. While this was damning, it wasn't the proof the prosecution needed to convict the defendant as, Rochelle Bond's story aside, there was nothing directly linking him to the murder. In fact, while it was generally believed the punches he delivered to Bella led to her death, the very fact that a definitive cause of death hadn't been determined meant it still wasn't considered a smoking gun. Even calling it a homicide at all was a risky move for the prosecution, as there was strictly nothing to prove the girl had been murdered. And making their case all the more difficult, they also had to contend with the fact that Michael continued to deny he had anything to do with the murder. As far as his lawyer was concerned, Michael wasn't even aware Bella had gone missing as Rochelle had also told him she was taken away by the Department for Children and Families sometime prior. Even if he had known about it, he couldn't have carried out the killing blows he was accused of because at the time he was partially disabled on account of having broken his collarbone while having a seizure. 
Then, when it came to his interests in the supernatural, that meant nothing when held in relation to this case as plenty of other innocent people out there had taken a scholarly interest in the same subject. Sure, he may have been interested in demons, and he may even have believed in them, but he certainly wasn't someone who felt Bella Bond needed to be killed as a result of her possession by one, something that was evident in an audio recording the court heard soon after. In the recording, the jury heard Michael talking to Bella after she had had a nightmare, with him explaining to her that she could use love to blow the heads off of any monsters she encountered rather than get violent with them. If that wasn't enough, he even went as far as to claim he wasn't living at the Bond residence at the time of her death as, after witnessing his partner's mistreatment of her daughter, he decided he wanted nothing more to do with it and left. Though that was contradicted in his statement to police when he claimed that Rochelle was a really good mother. It also doesn't explain why he wouldn't contact the authorities himself if he felt the situation was serious enough. For as convincing as he may have been to some, his tale started to fall apart once a text message sent from his phone to Rochelle's was presented to the court. In the text, he wrote, quote, don't tell them you have a daughter. We don't want the Department of Children and Families getting involved. This seemed to suggest he at least had knowledge something bad had happened to Bella, and that they shouldn't let anyone know about it in case it caused the relevant authorities to come sniffing around. As if that wasn't damning enough, someone who described themselves as a lifelong friend of Michael's took the witness stand and claimed he had previously warned Rochelle of the danger she was putting herself into by getting involved with the defendant. Why was that? Well, for as long as he had known Michael, there had always been a dark side to him, one that was heavily tied to his obsession with demons and satanic rituals. The witness claimed that he actually believed he had the ability to expunge demons from a residence or, in some cases, even a person. In the end, that was enough to convince the jury of eight women and four men, and on June 26, 2017, Michael McCarthy was found guilty of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility after 20 years. As Colonel Richard McKeon, superintendent of the Massachusetts State Police, said in a statement following the decision, quote, This is not a joyous day, but it is a necessary one. The verdict cannot bring Bella back, and cannot change the fact that she was failed, colossally and tragically, by the adults in her life. But the verdict is right, and justice has been rightly served upon the person who took this beautiful child's life. When it came to Rochelle's trial, the jury agreed she should hold a degree of culpability. So perhaps realizing her time was coming, she got ahead of it and changed her plea to guilty a few months prior on February 10th. When it came to her sentence, though, well, that would be far less severe. In fact, she wouldn't be sentenced to any prison time at all. On account of the threats that were apparently made on her life, the judge took pity on her and awarded her time served. This meant the bulk of the punishment that she would have to endure would be a mere two years of probation, and given the severity of the crime, it was considered by many to be getting off scot-free. As Assistant District Attorney at the time, David Deacon would explain, quote, That's the evil of heroin. Rather than doing something about her situation, rather than doing what was right, she did what was easy. She did what was painless. She went to the drugs. So if Rochelle was considered to only have a minor role in her daughter's death, the real focus should be on ensuring the actual killer remains behind bars. In June of 2021, Michael McCarthy attempted to appeal his conviction. In his appeal, he maintained his stance that he was innocent, with him now arguing that Bella could have died after accidentally ingesting her mother's prescription medication. Apparently, pink fluid had been found in the stomach of the dead girl, and Rochelle Bond's medication came in the form of pink-colored pills. If that was the case, he argued, justice had not been served for his stepdaughter as both an innocent man was behind bars and a woman guilty of perjury was walking around the streets free. Unfortunately for him, though, the Supreme Court didn't see any legitimacy to those claims, and that was why they threw the whole thing out. As they would put it, quote, the credibility of Bond's testimony was for the jury to decide. And of course, they decided to find him guilty. 
but even with the killer behind bars for the foreseeable future, and the mother of Bella Bond apparently trying to move on with her life. That's still not the end of the story, because in the weeks and months which followed the initial trial, questions began being asked about how the situation could have happened when the Department of Children and Families had received numerous prior complaints. That was certainly something the people who had made those complaints wanted answers to, and it was something the public were now desperate to know as well. An investigation was conducted by the Office of the Child Advocate, an independent organization that oversees the child welfare system. It wasn't long before they uncovered some serious errors that had been made. Outside of the obvious fact that two people deep in the throes of drug addiction were allowed to keep full access to the child despite numerous concerns having been raised by both neighbors and friends, there was also the discovery that a DCF worker had copied information over from a 2006 report when writing up reports about incidents involving Bella in 2012 and 2013. That represented a serious breach of conduct as it meant the situation Bella was in was being misrepresented, with that potentially being what led to no further action being taken at the time. For anyone hoping there would be a real punishment for that, they'd end up being disappointed as the OCA also discovered the DCF had been made aware of the error a couple of years after it happened and had issued a mere formal written warning to the worker in question as a result. It should come as no surprise, though, as that's the way bureaucracy usually works, protecting those within its system. Even though the exact details of Bella's death are not completely clear, what is clear is that a little girl died because Michael McCarthy and Rochelle Bond were more focused on drugs and their own pleasure than they were of treating a child like a human being. In or out of prison, nobody should ever forget that they are both monsters. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.